Hello, I'm Paul Netto, and I'm a visiting researcher here at the Institute for Geoeconomics. Today I'm sitting down with Andrew Capistrano, who's also a visiting research fellow at the Institute for Geoeconomics, and he's also brand new. He's only been with us since April. So Andrew, thank you to the Institute for Geoeconomics, and thank you to Geoeconomic Briefing. Thank you, Paul. So, you have recently wrapped up a piece for our Geoeconomic Briefing that talks about the geoeconomic triangle. Now I'm a little bit surprised because we've been told very clearly from the discourse, from the media, from all the associated chatter all over the world that the world is dividing into decoupling. You can't have a three-way decoupling. You've got a split between the United States and China. So what is this triangle that you were talking about? Well, I think it's easy to see the world in terms of the US and China, the two biggest economies in the world. But it's important to recognize that uh, the EU as a common market represents the third biggest uh, uh, market in the world. It accounts for one sixth of global trade, it accounts for one sixth of global economic activity. So if there's any uh, nation or, uh, or grouping of supranational grouping of nations that will be most affected by the so-called US-China decoupling, it would be the European Union and its member states. Now, similar dynamics can be found in Japan, India, other nations are facing the uh, US-China economic competition. But I think the EU case for several reasons, not to mention the fact that it's the third largest economy, will be uh, decisive in making this the most important geoeconomic triangle that is emerging. But does it really rise to mm. the level of a triangle, like not just two mm. poles, but mm. a three-way nexus? It sounds a little bit like a distinction without a difference mm. because I think a lot of people would say that the European Union is almost just an appendage of the United States. Uh, that we're really just talking about the West mm. united behind the United States and that the EU is just, you know, within that umbrella. What do you say to that? Well, I would say that that's how most Americans do see it. The, the, the fact is, though, that the EU common market project and then later the euro in the 2000s, were both created to essentially create the EU as a separate pole, one that could stand alone, one that had a greater leverage than the individual nation states composing it to uh, engage in economic bargaining with the United States. As each individual nation, you, you could say there's a triangular dynamic going on with the US-China uh, so-called decoupling, but it's from a, a larger standpoint of the supranational bloc of the EU, uh, you could definitely see the uh, the tendency of the U.S. and China to both see the EU as the prime target or the, the biggest prize in uh, securing the uh, future of the global economy. In other words, whoever the EU will align with, the U.S. or China, could prove to be decisive in rewriting the next stage of the rules of the global economy. Now, you touch on this in your piece, mm. specifically about China and the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm. Unpack that. Mm. I unpack, explain how the Belt and Road Initiative illustrates China's view of the European Union as potentially one of these, you know, as a third vortex. Well, when the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, first announced, um, you know, the One Belt, One Road in 2013 mm -hmm. by Xi Jinping, the U.S. was uh, skeptical, skeptical from the beginning of this as a, as a project that would, um, you know, unite the Eurasian landmass, create uh, a new sort of, uh, a new, I guess you could say entanglement between Europe and Asia, but continental rather than maritime. But at the time, Europe was far less skeptical. You can look at you can look just as far back as uh, ten years ago, when Xi Jinping and Merkel met in uh, Duisburg and were very triumphal in welcoming that uh, cargo train coming from Chongqing to mm -hmm. uh, deliver all kinds of Chinese manufactured goods. Italy signed on to the BRI mm -hmm. in 2019, so it, <laughs> the BRI offered an opportunity for China. Once it had uh, constructed many uh, pieces of infrastructure domestically to use this uh, labor, this skill set, and this uh, sort of raw materials to start building uh, externally. So that's one side of it. The other side would be for Europe. Europe saw China as its growth engine, especially mm -hmm. following the euro crisis and the, the great financial crisis, mm -hmm. the great recession. Um, at this time, Europe saw China as potentially the key to its economic future and the BRI as being one avenue of securing that. Mm -hmm. Did the EU understand that this was part of a geopolitical game, perhaps, to split the EU away from the United States? Was that part of the calculation or were they just thinking, hey, infrastructure? Please. I think they were thinking infrastructure. They were thinking markets. This is the time when uh, the EU press was talking about the north-south divide, Germany versus 
uh, Spain, Portugal, right. Italy, Greece, right? The, the pigs, right? So at this time, I think that the EU was uh, concerned about its own internal cohesion and seeing mm -hmm. the possibility of, of markets as a way in order to let these southern states have some sort of uh, some some possibilities for growth. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is uh, this is why China built uh, or took steadily took control over the port of Piraeus in Greece. Right. Like I said, Italy joined the BRI, Spain and Portugal as well uh, were, were seen as, uh, you know, uh, liabilities for mm -hmm. the for the EU and the Euro project. But the idea was, is that hopefully with Chinese investment, these these uh, southern European nations might be able to rise to uh, to the economic status of the north. All right. So fast forward, maybe a decade or mm -hmm. so. How's this going? Mm -hmm. Do you successfully Pride off of the United mm -hmm. States alignment? Mm -hmm. I think China thought that if it could integrate the Eurasian landmass, create European dependency on China, it could essentially uh, pull two poles of the economy, Europe and China, together. Pulling them together would then isolate the United States and force the United States to come to terms with this new alignment or else risk its uh, economic hegemony. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, did not necessarily work out the way uh, China expected, and, and not and not for lack of trying. Um, generally, uh, you can see a a major turning point occurring around when Obama does the, does the pivot to Asia. Then and you're you have, talking around 2012, give or take. Yes, yes, you can see uh, mm -hmm. you can see some concern developing, especially mm -hmm. with Chinese ownership over ports, this sort of thing. But the real turning point came uh, with the U.S.-China trade war. So mm -hmm. in this sense, the collateral damage that uh, spilled over from this really made China, I think, start looking at, uh, or sorry, really, this really made the EU start looking at China um, in terms of a competitor and a strategic dependence. This perception was only reinforced by the COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. the Hong Kong protests, all of the sanctions on European leaders for speaking out against China's uh, policies in Xinjiang. And mm -hmm. it, things came to a head, I think, in the, uh, in the early 2020s, I mean, you look at the the wolf warrior diplomacy with the led by China's ambassador to France. Mm -hmm. These these sorts of things made the, uh, Europe more skeptical about China as mm -hmm. a uh, economic partner. At the same time, European dependency on key uh, uh, Euro European dependency on China for key markets for exports, but also the flooding of Chinese goods into Europe began to this. Products this, like electric goods vehicles, like electric vehicles, solar panels, solar panels uh, Huawei powered uh, surveillance equipment. Um, there, there was many. It sounds risky. Sounds risky, and I think Europe began to start seeing China in a different light, uh, and not necessarily seeing it as a future growth engine, but as actually this might be our competitor of the future. So my theme today mm -hmm. is forcing you into false dichotomies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We've already done that with the new Cold War. Mm -hmm. I'm going to force you into another one now. Mm -hmm. Is this a result of countries thinking strategically or materially? Mm. Is the EU thinking about this in a bigger picture strategic chessboard, or are they just thinking about resources, trade, economic growth? Is China thinking about this in terms of a grand strategic plan to divide mm. the United States and the European Union, or are they just thinking like, hey, investment mm. and internal development? Well, I think all three of these uh, vertices of this triangle are, are thinking about it in both ways. It's, the, it's really the degree to which they lean towards one or the other. Um, certainly, like I said, Europe started to see these dependencies on China as possibly a risk more than an asset beginning in the early 2020s. But what made Europe really sit up and start thinking about this strategically was, of course, the Russia-Ukraine war, mm -hmm. um, the, the strengthening of the Sino-Russian strategic partnership. China's implicit aid, perhaps not non-military at this point, but aid to Russia. With the Ukraine war, you saw not only a tightening of the EU mm -hmm. uh, around a, a, a semi-common position, of course there's outliers, but you also saw a tightening of NATO. You saw mm -hmm. a tightening of the US, uh, the transatlantic relationship, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of strategic uh, impact, I think that it's not necessarily just being viewed as a as markets anymore. Mm -hmm. the, the EU has released its a, 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 a steady stream of new economic security policy and industrial mm -hmm. policy documents, um, you know, beginning in early 2023, the EU economic security strategy has been updated. It's added further initiatives. Um, I think they are, the EU is starting to see things a little more strategically. Of course, you have to realize the EU does not have a common foreign policy. This makes it different from China and the United States. Germany has its own policy. 
France has its own policy. We saw when China's uh, when the EU's report on China's market distortions was released. Mm -hmm. Chancellor Scholz was in Beijing seeking to open up new business opportunities. So it's not necessarily um, seen fully from a strategic perspective, at least from the European view. China, mm -hmm. I think, sees it in, in a more strategic way. Uh, China is looking for uh, new markets, especially if the U.S. closes to Chinese goods, the 100% mm -hmm. tariff on EVs, for example. Right. If China, if China face, sees itself um, uh, losing markets in, in the advanced economies for these high-end consumer goods, the, Europe is the obvious uh, place to fill that gap. Um, I think that there's a, a, a view of, of economics and strategy as, as I wouldn't say identical, but mm -hmm. it's certainly with, aligned and contingent on one another in China mm -hmm. in a way that I think Europe is only now recently waking up to. So I'm going to ask you to make a verdict mm -hmm. on how everyone mm -hmm. is doing with this. Mm -hmm. Because I think you're exactly right that, you know, economics is strategy and vice mm -hmm. versa. But my question for you, is anyone actually good at this? Is mm -hmm. anyone positioning themselves better off today than they were, say, 10 years ago mm -hmm. when the BRI kicked off or anything like that? You look at the United States, you've had an international economic strategy that's effectively adrift. You look at the EU and they seem to have been a little bit late, as an American would say, to the risks from China. And China may have overplayed or misplayed its own hand in trying to do its own strategy. So give us a verdict. Is anyone actually good at this? Is anyone better off? Well, I'd say that um, I'm not sure if, they, if, they're, if anyone is very uh, good at this, so to speak, if you put it in that terms. Um, China, I think uh, its biggest problem is it, is it finds it difficult to understand how these foreign perceptions of non-economic related things like, for example, the use of labor in Xinjiang. Right. It's, it's I think it was difficult for China to see the full implications of that in Europe uh, because, oh, Europe needs our markets. You know, where's France going to sell its cognac, its luxury goods? Where's Germany going to export its automobiles to? Mm -hmm. What about the Airbus contract? These sorts of things, uh, you would think that a purely... I, I don't want to say amoral, but a, a, transactional. a purely a transactional, uh, purely economically rational and efficient nation would not sacrifice these sorts of economic relationships for these uh, sort of you know, moral causes or for human rights issues, so to speak. I think China was slow to recognize that, uh, that the European Union would, would see these issues this way. So if China seeks greater markets in Europe, is it willing to sacrifice its support for Russia in the Ukraine war? It's hard to say what's more important uh, to China. So in China, I think, is uh, it certainly has more of a, a, a longer game plan than the European Union with this respect. But I think that there's a, a huge problem between perception and reality when it comes to how Beijing presents its policy. Uh, Europe, you could argue that Europe is uh, not good at this. You could argue that Europe has that added factor of whereas America, Japan, even China, you have national firms, then mm -hmm. you have you know national policy, and then these are the the national governments. That's what is the verdicts in the geoeconomic triangle. That mm -hmm. added layer between national policy of supranational policy, for example, does does the European Economic Security Strategy benefit all European states, nation states, all of their interests identically? Mm -hmm. It's it's clear it does not. Hmm. But nevertheless, that that means to, in order to find some sort of convergence. Uh, in which all can agree and pass the European Commission, then you need to uh, essentially sacrifice things. You're dealing with 27 states, and you're only going to be able to agree on the basics, on the fundamentals. The actual details are going to be much harder to implement. So Europe definitely has some work to do. The, 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 the plus side for Europe is that um, I think that it's beginning to see itself as the U.S.-China competition heats up, as you know, not only the Russia-Ukraine war, but also the Israel Gaza war, mm -hmm. they're seeing to see things from a more geopolitical angle than it was used to, where the mm -hmm. common market was seeing itself more as a uh, uh, just a market. You may, I think that uh, Macron's recent speech about strategic autonomy puts this into view. So mm -hmm. if Europe is able to, to, to stand together, if the member states are able to create a more cohesive supranational bloc, one that's able to bargain with the United States and uh, China, then it could, it could see itself... Um, you know, become quite useful. It, it, it could see itself become bid over between where the U.S. and China are essentially um, competing for its affections, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And in that sort of a sense, if they can get their act together, if they can um, sort of unite behind a common 
economic security policy, a common geoeconomic policy, then one could say that Europe may do better in the future. Andrew Capistrano, yeah. thank mm -hmm. you very much. To find out more, be sure to check out Andrew's piece in the Geoeconomic Briefing, which will be coming out shortly. Be sure to like, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you. どんどんこのスモールヤードが大きくなっているというのが現状で